Hey, we have Const <laughs> Constantine. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Constantinos Vambrelis, and uh, I'll be presenting my work on treatment of diabetes type 2 with rosiclidazone and a general framework about how to approve or not a drug um, and taking into account its safety. Um, and uh, this, is, this could also be my, what I've done during my first year of PhD at the Department of Statistics. So the data set we have is, is the golden standard of uh, drug safety, is a clinical trial data set. Um, subjects, individuals, a number of individuals that there should be considered uh, um, independent uh, in, in every respect and, and, and uniformly uniform and representing the population are assigned randomly to a treatment group and a control group. The, the, the control group receives a placebo, the treatment group receives the treatment, and then you measure three effects or more. In this particular case, I have three effects. Um, we have the in, the, in the third column, we have whether the individual experienced nausea, the next is whether they experienced dyspepsia, and the last one is their levels of hemoglobin, which is a, a, a marker for di diabetes. And the first two are binary, the last one is continuous. This is pretty typical for clinical trials data sets. Um, and the question I have for everyone, um, and definitely for me, when I started working on this is, um, how do you go to a yes or no answer? How do you go with uh, approving or not a drug like this? And it's, it's difficult. Um, it definitely made me appreciate more the job of the regulators. Um, as an example, I went to Wikipedia and looked at the available information for the US and European regulators who kind of went back and forth approving and not approving the drug. And um, at least the, the US have gone back and forth like three times, and I'm not sure where it is right now. But hopefully what I'll present today is a general framework that can help understand uh, better this effects and maybe explain even, uh, if that's possible, why there is uh, there's uncertainty, in this particular case at least, of rosiclidazone, for which we have the data. Um, so the first thing that one would try to do is, um, is, a, is a, an average effect uh, table and just look at the differences between the two groups. Uh, so what happened actually is uh, one, of my, one of the collaborators on this paper, uh, Larry, who is a professor in management school, has been working with drugs for a long time, um, said, this is what is done now. This is you know, what the industry is doing and the regulators and so on. And I know it's not good. And uh, I want to do better, but I'm not exactly sure. I want to do it basically. I want to do like a full model, but I'm not sure how. Um, so actually, it didn't come to us. It came to my advisor. And, um, and then my advisor said, um, OK, that's fine. We, we can definitely do that. But it's too easy for me, so I'll assign a student to that. Um, and the first, the first thing I thought was, okay, it's definitely not easy. And the second thing I thought is like, I've been chosen to represent the Bayesian world. And it was very, you know, very intense. I, I, feel like I thought I had to do my best. So hopefully, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll present something that makes sense and I'm very happy to take feedback and please come talk to me if you have ideas about, uh, about this. So, so this general framework is you start with the clinical trials data. This is the matrix Y. Without the individual uh, sub, the subject ID, you don't need that. So you, you know you have two treatment, two matrices, one for treatment, one for control. That's your numbers. It's just literally numbers in a matrix format. And then you characterize somehow the distribution of the effects, the effects that you're measuring. Uh, that assumes that the effects are already chosen for you, um, which is a lot of the times the case. It was for us here. Um, and then you need to combine all of this into a single value S, which is a preference score. Uh, and then you will ask questions about this score, like what is the probability that the score for the treatment is higher than the control given the data? Uh, and generally that will basically be how you generalize from the trial to the population, which we really care about the population. Um, that's what the clinical trials uh, is, you know, is supposed to do. Uh, and Really, the statistical question uh, here is the number two. How do you characterize the distribution of the effects? Uh, and, and this could be a different title for me. It would be a latent variable model for correlation of mixed data types, uh, which is interesting uh, from a statistical perspective and, and, and a Bayesian perspective, for sure. Uh, so this is what I'll present uh, mainly. Uh, uh, but you, you would be, you would be um, 
rightly thinking, okay, but how do you even, how do you calculate this one score? How do you take all this data, bring it down to one score? Um, so this is what, uh, this is what number three is, and I'll just have one slide on this. This will, will do with multi-criteria criteria decision analysis, MCDA. And this is a fairly uh, known practice, and uh, it's been done before for drugs also. So how do you do this? I mean, the whole point is to just bring down the, uh, the effects that you expect to have to one number. And you combine this with the following steps. You first have to standardize the effects, because one effect could be weight loss. One other effect is the, whether you experience the heart attack or not. Another effect is the glucose levels in your blood. So all of these things vary in different scales. They're not even the same type of data. So how do you do it? You, you map this, uh, this effect that you measure to a, a common scale between 0 and 100 or anything. But let's say 0 and 100, where the worst measurement is 0 and the best measurement is 100. Uh, and, and this can be anything in between. It can be a sigmoid function, it can be a linear function, and actually experts have ideas, like clinicians have ideas about how this function should look like. So um, in any case, you, you map everything there, and that takes also into account whether you should be expecting things to drop, like glucose levels should be dropping if you're taking diabetes treatment, um, and whether things should be going up, like perhaps you want less weight loss and so on. So this will map it in a common uh, scale. And then you get weights, which is uh, how important is one effect versus another? Like how important is it if, if you lose uh, two pounds versus uh, reducing your glucose levels by, by 4%, right? This is, the doctors have ideas about how important these things are. And you uh, capture this with these weights. And then you take a weighted sum, uh, basically an av a weighted average of this mapped values with the weights, and you do this for the control and treatment group, there you go, you have two numbers, you can compare them. And what, what the Bayesian thing will do is to just propagate the uncertainty about your model, the uncertainty about your parameters to these final numbers, S, T, and S, C. Um, so I'm going back now to the how do you characterize those effects, uh, now that we have a framework of how we get this one value. And um, previous work uh, basically did this first thing, and I saw the average effects, but it, it first of all it assumes that the effects are independent. If you just take a, uh, an averages value of the, of the clinical trials effects, it won't, it, won't, it won't capture the correlation between these two. And this is interesting because it's mixed data, this binary and continuous data. It could be Poisson also, uh, like counts, like how many ex uh, events of nausea did you experience and so on. And this is typical in clinical trials. Um, and it also doesn't account for individual variability. So the goal for the model is the probability of a new patient that we, were, was not in the clinical trial to, if they receive the treatment, what is the probability that their score they will receive will be higher than if they didn't receive the treatment, conditioned on the data you, you, you show in the clinical trial. That is the whole point. You, you put people through this test so that you can predict what will happen to a new patient in the future. Uh, and we want to account for the above issues. So this is our model. This is the model uh, that we have. And you can read it from top to bottom, or, or the generative process actually starts from the bottom, which assumes that the latent variable z is a, a multi-dimensional uh, Gaussian of length equal to the number of all your effects. And you only get to observe the last part of the effects that are continuous. So the glucose levels that are continuous, the hemoglobin levels that are continuous, you get to observe that. But the effects that are actually only observed through whether an event happened or not, the binary things, this go through a legit function um, or, or any link function, and, and, and you get to observe the outcome of a Bernoulli. Um, so this is the model, and every row here is independent. So every, every patient is independent of each other. You could introduce dependency there if you, if, if, if the, if you wanted. And this also extends easily to covariates, but we'll keep it simple um, in this form. Um, and what you really want is, at the end of the day, get these posterior samples. You want to learn the, the mean effect, the mean the joined um, effect uh, of, this jo of this joint latent distribution that you only observe for some of them through the Bernoulli and the others directly. You want to learn the covariance metric sigma, so their correlation. That's important. Um, and you might want to learn also the latent variable z, but that's not so important. And this is a good time to remember, actually, that the only reason why you want samples from the posterior is because you want to calculate expectations. That's the only reason why we, we do this. And 
This is the beauty, I think, of the mathematical Bayesian framework is that you can formulate question, any question you want with these posterior samples uh, of interest. For example, the probability of, uh, of the score in the population being higher than the control, or the probability of a new individual where you account for the individual variability. Uh, and, and you can condition on the data so that you take account of the full uncertainty over your parameters, or you can condition on uh, estimators over there at the bottom so you kind of like fix the, the numbers that you, you want. You say, okay, I really know that the mean now is estimated to be that, and I'll take this as the truth and so on. So, so this is actually, I think, an easier framework than the frequent, frequentist approach, which um, I don't know very well, but starting to read the literature, it just looked to me as if um, it wasn't so flexible, and, and, this, um, and it wasn't so easy to kind of put your um, knowledge and your choices in the model in there. So this is... I thought was was really really uh, elegant, and um, I'll now show how how this works uh, in our data set and how we used it. Um, and there is really nothing uh, nothing uh, changing, uh, nothing stopping us from having different decisions in the model. But this is just one model, and I'm, I certainly don't claim that this is not definitely the best. But it's it's nice as it's general; you can change it. So we used exactly this model, and the details are in the notebook, uh, and, and how the stand code and all that. But I'll just go through the results, where we had basically uh, two, con two groups, and we have uh, six effects. Uh, and next to the effects, I have the weights that the clinicians assigned. And these weights were given to us by the experts. Um, and and uh, I'm glad, because that's, that's something that the, it's, it's, it's their job. It's almost like a utility. Uh, so given these things, we run our model and we get posterior samples for the probability of experiencing, experiencing any of these events here, um, courtesy of base plot. And um, we also can uh, measure here the, uh, the, the mean of the, of the continuous effect. So this is the hemoglobin and glucose levels. You see that the average reduction on these two uh, important markers for diabetes was uh, between minus four and, uh, and minus one maybe, with glucose actually being reduced more. We have the variance for these two things. It's important to realize also that glucose is, 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 uh, uh, has more variance. This effects before is, uh, we can see that they are pretty rare, which is another important uh, reason why Bayesian uh, model would help if you, if you only get to observe very few cases of, of these events. And this is the correlation, the posterior correlation between the different uh, effects. And we see that they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they're not all, um, that most of them are close to zero. There is some correlation. In, a, in this data set, it so happens that it's not an enormous correlation, but it's a general framework that will find these correlations if they're there. And they're important because if you don't account for them, you're missing out. You're assuming that events, effectively these numbers are zero. And this is the final thing that uh, um, we, we wanted to calculate, is the score for a new individual for the, between the control and the treatment. And you can see that it's actually not that different. Um, the treatment is slightly higher, but not by that much. So the question is, how, you know, what is this probability uh, of uh, the score for a new individual taking this drug versus a control? You can calculate this with the posterior samples, and this is 62% in this case. Um, and this perhaps explains uh, why it's so difficult to judge whether a drug um, should be approved or not. Now, one thing that goes in here is the weight that the clinicians assigned, but, um, and one could say, you know, how important is this? And I've run some tests uh, to show that actually it doesn't change much. It's pretty robust. This result is pretty robust to, the, to changes in the weights unless you change the weights completely, which is actually a substantial change in your opinion about how you would judge this drug. So. Um, this is, um, this is a thing all I have. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to talk more about this model. And, and uh, um, yeah, thank you. You can contact me this. Thank you. Any questions? questions. OK, like, it was very, very interesting. Uh, just one question. Like, how did you actually compute the weights? I don't. The clinicians give it to us. Ah, OK. And uh, okay, I, I, can, I can tell you a little bit more that there's not, what is it, five, per, five means for, a, for an effect? It means that it's, um, you, you, the, way they, the way that you come up with the scores is not easy, actually. It's one of our, our decision theorists here 
has run the workshops to do this, but basically you got the clinicians and say, how important is it if you get a, a this much reduction in weight uh, versus this much reduction in the, in the glucose levels? And they say, oh, I think it's two, two, two times more important. But then this all has to be consistent. So maybe you ask them this, and then later you ask them another question, they change their mind. So you, you have to go, like, go into over iterations until in the end you have a consistent weight that sum up to one. Um, so it is a little bit involved. There is more details in the, pay, in the, in the notebook, uh, but it's up to the experts. That's, that's not my job. Um, uh, thank you for the very good talk. Um, I don't know how big the variance in the score was, but um, I'm always wondering when we have um, these trials and we're trying to see how effective a treatment is, uh, whether um, the effectiveness of a treatment is going to be just noise or random or whether it's going gonna, it's gonna to work well for some population of patients and not as well for other population of patients. And so, uh, especially in STAN, when we had the ability to, to, to do these generative models, um, is this something you have looked at or you would consider looked at? Um, and is it more generally, do you know if it's present in the literature? Yeah, I, 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 I can't talk about all the literature. I've certainly tried to read you know, everything that's out there. I haven't found many Bayesian approaches to this, so I haven't seen it. Um, what people normally care about is the, the, the population effect. Uh, they don't care about a new individual, which actually some of the experiments I've done uh, sort of show that the individual would have higher variance, right? And, and that is captured from the clinical trials. They, you get to see 100 individuals, and then you learn that, okay, even though the population might be this, when you give it to a specific person, their reaction actually is uncertain, so it's quite wider. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the point of the clinical trials, as far as I understand it, could be wrong, is that the individuals are interchangeable, right? So they don't have, but you could have covariates, and, and it's easy to actually add the covariates here. It's very easy. Uh, the only reason I haven't done it is because that was not the interesting part from a statistical perspective. But if you have it and it explains, then you should definitely do it, and it, it shouldn't change anything in the way it fits. And, and there's definitely work to be done, future work, um, but that, that's definitely something that is of interest. Okay, it looks like, thank, well, first of all, thank you very much. <laughs>